Hidden in ten acres of landscaped gardens near Isha, Surrey, is one of the treasures of the 20th century. The Homewood, built in the 30s by a young architect for his parents and through the National Trust soon to belong to the nation. The architect, Patrick Gwynne, is now 81 and still lives here today. It's a terrible thing to say, but it cost £10,500, including all the built-in furniture. And um, I'm not going to tell you what that costs now, because one has to multiply by 100 or something. <laughs> An awful lot of people came to the house, mostly our younger friends. And in those days, we did an awful lot of dancing. And so, hence, in this room, the um, maple floor, which is the sort of best dance floor you can possibly have, it's also sprung a bit. And um, it was also a large enough room that you didn't have to move the furniture very much in order to dance. With a thousand little stars, With a thousand little stars we can decorate the ceiling with an optimistic feeling. We can build a little home. Every single little dream is a shingle or a rafter. We can paint the house with laughter when we build a little home. It's not a palace nor a poorhouse, but the rent is absolutely free. This is my house, but it's your house if you'll come and live with me. The Homewood is precious because it is so little changed. Much of the original furniture and fittings is still here. It's a rare example of the modern movement in Britain, and it's to be left to the National Trust in Patrick Gwynne's will. Well, I have no um, offspring or relatives who would want to live or be able to live in the house, and I felt that if it was put on the market after my time, that it would almost certainly be bought by the wrong people who would um, possibly misuse it, possibly furnish it in a totally unsuitable way, which would seem to me a great pity. And I felt if the, if the Trust wanted to bring their buildings up to date, <laughs> it was an opportunity for them. And I feel that that will preserve the house in some way that I would like. The National Trust for England, Wales and Northern Ireland is just 100 years old. At its Westminster headquarters, it is the daily custom of the staff to take tea with freshly baked scones. They are now part of a grand concern, with some 207 historic houses, 600,000 acres of land, 550 miles of coastline. There are some 6,000 employees, permanent or seasonal, and two and a quarter million members more than all three main political parties put together. Um, and it's got to be made tax effective and, and all that. Yeah. I mean, whether it will come to anything. But... All this might have surprised the three idealistic founders, whose idea was to save lovely views, old ruins and manor houses for everlasting delight. The Christian socialist Octavia Hill wanted open-air sitting rooms for the poor. Another trinity makes the decisions today. All three of us have, have uh, seen Appleby quite recently. Um, it's on the market, and the question is, should the Trust take it on? It didn't quite meet up my expectations when I, when I first saw it, particularly um, in the interior. Well, I agree with you. Um, romantic though it is, and wonderful though its relationship is with the village, um, <coughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a castle of the second rank. It's better than Manchester. Or, um, yeah. Lord Chorley, Chairman of the Trust, Accountant and Mountaineer. Director General Sir Angus Stirling, in his spare time Chairman of the Royal Opera House. And Martin Drury, Director General in Waiting. The National Trust's purpose is to protect, now and in the future, those parts of our countryside and historic places that people hold to be very special, either for their beauty or their historic interest, places that people go back to again and again for spiritual refreshment. For most people, the jewels in the Trust's crown are the historic houses. This is Powys Castle, North Wales.
The long gallery dates from 1587. The state bedroom, unique in Britain, echoing Louis XIV's Versailles. Blickling Hall, Norfolk. The library, with its intricate Jacobean plaster ceiling in praise of the senses. The Vine, Hampshire a classical 18th century entrance hall. And a romantic Gothic tomb chamber, also 18th century. Attingham Park, Shropshire. One of the first picture galleries in a country house, designed by John Nash. Saltram, Devon, the 18th century great kitchen with 600 copper pans and moulds. The white bedroom at Cotille, Cornwall, a Tudor house with its faded 17th century tapestries. And Cragside, Northumberland. Here lived William Armstrong, inventor and international arms manufacturer. It was the first house in the world to be lit by hydroelectricity. Norman Shaw completed the drawing room in time for the Prince of Wales' visit in 1884. The great chimney piece, Italian marble, carved in London and said to weigh 10 tons. At the other end of the scale, also in Northumberland, is George Stevenson's birthplace, perhaps the least visited property of the National Trust. The tenant sits and waits. They do not come. Today we've had 10 visitors. The most we've ever had was 63 on a bank holiday, and the least we've ever had was none. Elsewhere, the National Trust is a victim of its own success. This is Dovedale in the Peak District, a place of pilgrimage, where the progress can be slow. Dovedale is one of the most visited open properties of the National Trust and it's estimated that between two and three million people actually come into Dovedale each year and of those something like three quarters of a million walk the entire route from the Stepping Stones to Hartington. On busy bank holidays uh, camps have been done and 3,000 people an hour walk up past the Stepping Stones. A lot of people come to get away from it all and find that it's come out with them. The Peak District is surrounded by the great Midlands industrial cities. For 10 million people, it's an easy drive to the steep gorge of the River Dove, as the warden knows only too well. The landscape can take a certain amount of, of wear and tear, but when thousands of people follow the same line, uh, it, it can't cope. And the main pathway has been subject to a program of 10 years redevelopment, as it were and a hard all-weather footpath's been put in through the whole length of Dovedale, which means you can walk from the Stepping Stones to Hartington without getting your boots dirty, really. When the 
new path was put in, one of the criticisms was that it was likened to a motorway in the middle of a beautiful area. But I think time has shown that the right decision has been made because it's confined the erosion just to the path. There are no crowds here. The public has not been allowed to visit Orford Ness on the Suffolk coast for 80 years. They experimented with radar here. Then they tested the trigger mechanisms of atom bombs. The trust bought the site derelict and vandalized two years ago for three and a half million pounds. The Trust's Foundation for Art has commissioned Dennis Crefield, known for his paintings of medieval cathedrals, to record his impressions of Orford Ness. It's my England, actually. It's, it's, that, it's got that sort of quality of, of my England 20th century, you know, uh, beautiful, sad, redundant, uh, uh, poignant, uh, you know, I have my first fags and sex and such built. Do you know, it's an architecture which isn't, you wouldn't call it beautiful, but it's, it's part, it's, it feels so strongly to, with our, our world, what, this grotty, but there is a beauty in that grottiness. There's no grandeur about this. There's just a sort of sadness. The Trust now owns five miles of the history of 20th century warfare. What is it to do with this place? I think we're, we're pretty certain as to those that we want to keep and those that we want to take down. And it just leaves us with the <coughs> main atomic weapons research site here as to what we should do with these enormous structures. I think we've got to be very careful about tidiness, you know, not having our usual National Trust gut reaction that we must tidy things up. Well, I think we're saying again we're not going to get into the business of tidying up because there is a straightforward choice. Either you tidy up these buildings, you remove all the bits that could drop off them, clear them out so that they're absolutely clean, safe and tidy. And we're all saying we don't want to do that. But even if we do agree that to a great extent we're going to leave the building to degrade in its own way, we should still do a limited amount of sealing up, of blocking up windows, etc. Because what we don't want to do is cut off possibilities in the future. It may be that future generations all think of them in, in, as being much more significant than we do. This generation thought a la Ronde in Devon significant enough for the Trust to buy it three years ago for nearly £300,000. Two spinster cousins built it late in the 18th century. They decorated the top gallery themselves exquisitely with shells and feathers. <laughs> 